to get us going on the next segment of Antitrust Festivus, the FTC versus the rest of us. I had to get that into the record. <laughs> is, uh, I need to introduce every, someone you all are well familiar with, I'm sure. Uh, Ashley Baker, who is the Director of Public Policy for the Committee for Justice. She is the uh, uh, founder of the Alliance on Antitrust, the coalition of conservative and pro-market organizations that's focused on preserving the consumer welfare standard as uh, the rational and uh, objective basis for our antitrust system. And uh, she's well uh, published in multiple uh, publications, including uh, USA Today, Fox News, Law 360, and she uh, is uh, an expert on Supreme Court pol uh, regulatory policy, antitrust, and judicial nominations. And she's been involved in the uh, nomination confirmation uh, uh, of uh, Justices Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. Um, but in addition to that, she leads our efforts on antitrust, and it's my pleasure to work with her. And she's going to moderate this panel, and I'm very pleased to pr present her to you. Thank you, Jim. Um, and Jim, Jim also needs no introduction, especially for those of you who um, work on the Hill, which I see quite a few of you there. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so today we have two, with us um, for a chat two experts on the Federal Trade Commission and antitrust and administrative law. That's kind of a very important nexus of where things are right now. Um, so I, I thought it would be a good idea to get together and have a conversation about this. So first we have um, Corin Wong Urban. Corin is recognized is a recognized thought leader and has testified before Congress on domestic and international antitrust issues. She has more than 18 years of experience, including representing defendants and plaintiffs in high-stake litigations and representing technology companies in domestic and foreign investigations. Corin previously served at the Federal Trade Commission as attorney advisor to Commissioner Joshua Wright and counsel for intellectual property and international antitrust. Corin's scholarship has been cited by courts and the Department of Justice. She has authored over 60 articles, including on vertical mergers and restraints, acquisitions of potential competitors, consummated mergers, multi-sided platforms, the intersection of antitrust and intellectual property, incremental innovations or product hopping, um, optimal penalties, extraterritoriality, methodologies for calculating patent infringement damages, and international due process and convergence. Corin has also trained approximately 500 foreign judges and competition enforcers on antitrust law and economics, and spoken at over 150 domestic and international events. Second, we have John Vecchioni. Mr. Vecchioni is a senior litigation counsel for the nonprofit New Civil Liberties Alliance, representing clients against the administrative state. He is previously president and CEO of the nonprofit Cause of Action Institute, also advancing the constitutional order. He practiced at a number of D.C. area law firms, including the eponymous John J. Vecchioni Law Firm. Mr. Vecchioni focuses his, practices, his practice on strategic litigation in the federal district and appellate courts, including the Supreme Court of the United States. He is an experienced trial and appellate advocate, having tried cases and argued appeals across the country. He is a member of the bars of the state of New York, the District of Columbia, and the Commonwealth of Virginia, as well as the Supreme Court of the United States and many federal courts. His cases are reported in scores of published opinions. He also published pieces advancing the freedom agenda and constitutional order in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Times, and many other forums. So without further ado, I, I think we'll start kind of with the more recent events first and, and work our, out a bit broader. But you know, there's been a lot of talk over this Section 5 policy statement on unfair methods of competition. My question for both of you is, you know, what are your bigger takeaways and concerns with this? How enforceable is it from a practical standpoint? And also, how likely is this to survive in court? Sure, so uh, I'll start. Can you guys hear me? Great. Uh, so thank you so much to Ashley and to the Committee for Justice for inviting me. I will give a little disclaimer. I'm a partner at a law firm and we represent clients. Uh, some of my clients have an interest in what I'll talk about, including Google. Uh, you know, I'll share though primarily from, or from my own view. Uh, as I've expressed when I was in academia and in FTC, it really hasn't changed much. So. With that aside, I'll talk about the policy statement a little. And I really will try to give what I think are the best arguments 
the fairest case for the FTC, uh, this administration's position, so that we can really have a dialogue about sort of where the rubber meets the road, right? And um, I, I think that's important. So uh, as was discussed on the last panel, on November 10th, there was a new policy statement issued. It was voted out along party lines with uh, Commissioner Christine Wilson dissenting. And this replaced the 2015 bipartisan statement under the Obama administration. And the reason I think that statement was so important, and I was there working in then Commissioner Josh Wright's office, is that while it was short, and maybe some, as was mentioned on the last panel, thought it didn't say enough, it really said a lot. What it said is we have this whole body of case law from the Supreme Court and appellate courts on Section 2 of the Sherman Act and how we do the analysis, how we do an effects-based rule of reason analysis, and we're going to tether the unfair methods of competition provision of Section 5 to that case law. So we're going to give it some meaning, right? And the beauty to me of the consumer welfare standard and the rule of reason is that it tethers antitrust to the methodological rigors of economics in terms of we can have theories with testable implications, right? Did output go down? Did a price go up? How was innovation harmed? And businesses can have some sense of how to structure their practices to, so that they can comply with the law, which I think is really important. So Ashley mentioned an important thing. How likely is this statement to survive in court? Well, as Dan mentioned on the last panel, it's not binding law, right? The statement itself won't be challenged in court, but the statement's approaches may be. So what, what should the approaches are likely to survive? And so what are we talking about? First, let's just step back. The FTC really said there's, there's two criteria that are determined on a sliding scale for whether something may constitute an unfair methods of competition. And one is that list of adjectives, right? the coercive, exploitative, collusive, predatory, exclusionary. And almost all of those words, except for the word exploitative, are from binding Supreme Court precedent. So not that far out on a limb. The second part is this uh, tends to negatively affect competitive conditions, right? So this, as Dan was saying in the last panel, not even like, you know, this much probability or likelihood, but this tends to negatively affect. Um, and importantly, there's also this monopoly broth kind of idea, right? And not only monopoly broth that, you know, that's, that zero plus zero could equal one of your own conduct, so, so conduct that alone wouldn't violate the law, but when taken together could, but there's this con concept of not just your conduct, but when combined with someone else's, right? And that's pretty new. Um, they have collective abuse of dominance abroad, but we don't do that here in the states. Uh, then in terms of efficiencies, it's the, the commission says, yeah, we'll, we'll consider them, maybe, um, but it's a very asymmetric burden, right? The, the parties have to prove actual net benefits. They have to actually kind of do some quantification, yet quantification alone is not sufficient, and the agencies can rely on this tends to negatively affect. So I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what's likely to survive. So, you know, look, binding Supreme Court precedent is what they cited, uh, which would probably allow a lot of what they did. And to give them credit, you know, they say, look, we're the ones that are being true to legislative intent and legislative history and the text and the, 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 uh, the spirit of the law. It's the, you know, the, the, uh, the Clinton and Obama administration and, and all the ones, you know, that, that have really gone astray, right? And so a fair reading of the cases, it's, it's it, it, you know, they, it could be read. Now, do I think it will survive? Do I think if they bring something um, that's based on an exploitative abuse, so like excessive pricing, I don't. And I think that because... The, the, the last word from the Supreme Court on unfair methods of competition was from 1972, which is right at the end of this period of radical interventionist kind of theories, right? There, at, at that point, at the peak of it, the Supreme Court basically like openly mocked the use of economic analysis. And so we definitely aren't there anymore, right? We've had a revolution in the courts since then, uh, with the court saying, wait a minute, we have all this modern economics and 
why don't we come in line with it, right? And 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 evolving from per se legality and per and presumptions of illegality to to a real effects based approach. Uh, so I do. So I think you know, given the makeup of the court, given the decisions, and yes, these decisions were not under unfair methods of competition. They're under Section Two. But I think because the makeup of the court and the subsequent appellate court decisions on unfair methods of competition, I, I'd be really surprised if we were to see a lot of the approaches survive that weren't based on some sort of an effects-based analysis. Now, I, I, I do have comfort in, like I said, in the courts as a check, but it will take time. And in the meantime, we're going to see, I, I'm, I really fear, a real chilling effect in the marketplace on otherwise pro-competitive conduct. And Josh uh, Wright and Judge Douglas Ginsburg have a nice paper called The Culture of Consents, where they talk about the agency's ability to extract more through commitments than they could otherwise likely get in court because it is so costly and disruptive uh, to go through litigation. So I also expect that we'll see a lot of consents. Um, and so, you know, do I agree with the new statement? No, but I, I do think for parties going in or trying to think, you know, it's important to think where they're coming from, that they are the ones that are true to legislative intent. And um, in terms of, you know, what can be done on, on the Hill, um, you know, I know that that takes a, a long time, but I, I think we'll get into rulemaking in a minute, and I do think there, you know, there could be helpful clarifications. I'll stop there. And uh, so uh, I... Uh, I also thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's been, it was interesting, uh, the previous panel. Um, but I do have to say, I was, I was promised a fireplace, and the FTC might call that an unfairness uh, uh, penalty uh, if, if it found out about this. But in, in any event, um, I think, uh, you know, there was some very nice words said about the FTC um, by the prior panel, and uh, you'll get none of that out of me. Um, and I, I think that this, this statement, you know, it has a lot about the spirit of the law. And it's just like when someone talks about a living constitution, they're about to kill a part of it. And when they start talking about the spirit of the law, it means they don't have textual uh, support for their position. Uh, I, am, I am very wary of the spirit of the law arguments. Um, I, I think that, that, they, that they are dangerous. I also think that they have cited a lot of Supreme Court cases but I think this is an uh, example of the devil can quote scripture. Um, the, the, the things that they're doing here and that what they want to do is take the unfairness standards and, and warp the antitrust standards with that. We have different sections for different reasons. Um, if there's antitrust violations going on, then they should use those statutes. And I think to import, import import these concepts and mix them up, and there's always going to be some of it. I mean, it, it, it does overlap, but I, I just think it's a dangerous um, prospect. I have not read this case, this, uh, this uh, piece um, that you just discussed, but it, the, just the title of it uh, hits on something that I have written about in many of my briefs to the Supreme Court and AMG, and FTC is so insidious about this. It comes up with a scheme. And then, and by the way, a scheme is just a plan you don't like. Um, so it comes, up, it comes up with a scheme, and it says, uh, we're going to do this. And it doesn't take the first case against, uh, you know, a, a, against a big company. They don't, they don't take the first case. What they do is they threaten some small guy, and then they get a consent judgment. And they get the consent judgment. Then they go in some other court against some other unrepresented party or weakly represented party, and they get another consent judgment. And then they say, that's the law. Look, we got this, Your Honor, and they, and they do this. So the, the, uh, a true battle of the law um, of equally represented parties is not what they want to form the law. What they want is unrepresented parties to consent to things and then have a bunch of these and say, look, we do this all the time, Your Honor. Uh, who are you to say? Um, so I do think they will be doing that. I think it should be resisted uh, in the legal community to the extent you get your clients to do it. And one of the... Um, uh, one of the uh, things about this I want everyone to think about, because I think it has parallels to the current FTC. 
Um, one of the, the reasons I dislike the FTC so much is, is that I think it does a lot of things the Justice Department can do and that consumer suits can do. Um, and I do think that it is kind of unbound in a way it shouldn't be. And the thing that I find scandalous, and I think we may find scandalous even in a democratic administration, is when the FTC differs with the Justice Department on what antitrust law is. And this is particularly true in the, in the, in the um, patent area, I think. I don't think that the FTC has really internalized what the heck a patent is. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a trust granted to you by the government that you're allowed to exclude everybody else and be the only one to sell the new widget you invented. It is an exception to our law, and I don't think they've really internalized it. And I think the case that the FTC brought against Qualcomm, where you had the Justice Department putting in amicus briefs on, on behalf of Qualcomm, undermining what the FTC said the law was, I think that's a scandal of American law. I do not think that you should, if, if you have a, a president and you have an administration, you can't have the administration at odds over an important economic matter. But that's where the FTC may bring us. And, and because of Lena Khan's uh, youth and inexperience, um, I do think, and, and I, I will say what I think is an ideological monomania, um, I think she's going to lead the FTC into some of these mistakes in litigation. And I do think. Qualcomm had to resist that. They eventually won. They lost before Judge Ho, who's now on the Ninth Circuit. So I don't know how it'll go next, next time. But um, it, it took a lot of fortitude that corporations normally don't have. The, the um, general counsel there was, knew all these issues that we're talking about very well. He was, um, he, he, he was uh, I think, right to do it. He got total victory. The FTC lost because the FTC had overreached and crossed the Justice Department. Um, and I think that's what's going to happen here because I'll tell you one last story before I uh, pass, pass the ball, and that's this. When I first came to D.C., I came on an uh, internship in college, and the first place I worked was the Antitrust Division of Justice. It was in the Reagan administration under Anthony Nanny, so some of you uh, may have known his practitioner here now. And um, I was put, I was the intern, I was put in the office with this fellow who was about to retire. Now, this is the 80s. He had come during the Roosevelt administration, the Truman administration. So he's an old, and he was always grumbling to me. He said, I don't even know if we do antitrust anymore. By the 40s, we wouldn't let this happen. In the 40s, we wouldn't let this happen. And he said this all the time. Well, I think that they're not going to bring the 40s back. They, they are going to have to bring back economics and not just a dislike of, of bigness or of new ways to profit. I do think that that has been so ingrained in the current judiciary of everybody. The fact that the Obama administration put out the 2015 ruling, well, a lot of those people are getting appointed to courts. They think that way. So I think that they are walking into a buzzsaw that has, that, and they do not have the, um, the uh, legal nimbleness to do what they need to do to open up this whole new uh, area of law. That's my view. Thanks. I, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, so I, I do love the FTC. I was there. It was great. It's funny. When I moved to D.C. Uh, over a decade ago, I, I thought we should get rid of it except for the consumer protection function because it's so inefficient to have the duplication of agencies. Uh, you know, and look, it's a historic accident. We tell other countries, don't do it. Uh, but I don't, I don't think it's going away, so try to focus on, you know, solutions. But I, I know there's bills on the Hill to, to get, you know, to, to consolidate or get rid of the FTC. Um, I will say, you know, I, I think that we have true believers on, on e either side. Uh, I don't think, I mean, you know, uh, Chair Khan wrote about this when she was, you know, a law student and in academia. And so if you really believe that we have a rampant, t you know, uh, under enforcement problem and, and the world is kind of, you know, and, and consumers are harmed, then good for you for trying to do what you think will make a difference, right? So where does rubber meet the road, coming back to that? You know, one of the one of the main things in this debate is 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 the difference between you know faiths in markets to self correct over time and faiths in governments to intervene, right? The difference um, concerns over type one and type two errors or false positives and false negatives, and our Supreme Court has long, uh, you know, suggested or said we're more worried about intervening when we shouldn't because that can have a chilling effect across the market. Whereas if you don't intervene when maybe you should have 
the market can self-correct over time. Now, Europe and other jurisdictions, they don't buy this. They say, correct over time, like how long? You know, we need to do something now. And, you know, I, people know that I like empirics, that I want evidence, you know, and, but they'll say to me, okay, Corinne, you're more worried about type one errors, where's your evidence? And the truth is, it's a prior. I don't really have empirics. Now, what I can say is that if it were true that we had a systematic under enforcement problem resulting in harm to consumers, we would expect this to show up more systematically in the retrospectives we're seeing we have, but but we're not. But we need more studies, right? There's studies on each side. I rely on there's a robust body of empirical um, literature by former DOJ and FTC economists and others about vertical restraints being generally pro competitive benign. But some of that is older, and there are some newer studies trying to you know poke holes in it. So we need more studies to, um, but I, I, I think, uh, you know, this, this, this faith in markets or this type one, type two errors, the priors is going to allow you to read studies and be more comfortable with probabilities versus actual evidence of price output innovation harms. Well, you know, in that statement, though, there's one thing, one question I have about it that I'm a little, one question I have that I'm a little nervous about, about that is they say that there are harms that can't be measured that they're going to be addressing. We what do does that, that mean? already in the law. We, quant we do qualitative value. Uh, like, um, we, like, we actually never do a quantif. So the Microsoft DC Circuit case, the landmark says, we're going to do a three-part burden shifting, and we're going to actually balance anti-competitive harms with pro-competitive benefits. But no court has ever, or parties even putting, quantified, well, we have a billion dollars in harm and 1.2 billion in benefits, and then we net. Instead, it's qualitative. It's a lot of evidence, in a, and a lot of times, if you have a pro-competitive justification, business justification, the defendant wins and you go home. Courts just don't always credit those. So what they're saying is is kind of, it's what courts do right now under Section 2, and, and uh, it's it's not about, because you can't always quantify harms. You know, it, it's a qualitative. It's, it's people, it's, it's inferences of harm. So it's people saying, look, you know, I'm an equal, you're depriving an equally efficient competitor of minimum efficient scale, driving them up their supply curve. No efficient competitors can compete with you. We're going to infer from that substantial foreclosure. We're going to infer harm to consumers. Uh, so along the lines of enforcement, I, w I definitely want to get to the cases here in just a minute, but um, just on that general thing of enforcement versus rulemaking, and you have two um, various like schools of thoughts here about you know antitrust consent decrees or you know, other consent decrees issued by the agency versus should we have bright line rules? Um, does that add clarity? Is that better than just kind of swooping in out of nowhere and um, teaming up on, as John said, these smaller companies um, or larger ones? Um, what do each of you see as kind of the merits of each of those? Well, I, I am, un I think I'm unusual in the practice in that I prefer rules. I prefer regulation. And I prefer it because for two reasons. I want them to tell me what breaks the law. I don't want them to bring a case saying you broke the law and now we're all in the soup and you, you, you have to uh, take this on. I'm not a great fan of that. I do think, you know, the SEC sometimes has safe harbor and that sort of thing. And the FTC is kind of like, well, you know, anything can, and, and I, again, I'm going to bring up unfairness because that's mainly what I've dealt with with them. But, but um, you know, anything could be unfair uh, if in the eyes of the FTC very quickly. So I am, I do like regulations because you can comment on them, you can look at them, the profession can see what's going on, you can advise your client. I mean, this statement with the sliding scale, I know it's from a court case, and I also know that there are unquantifiable harms. I was thinking in the privacy area, when there's a data breach with no harm, like the, it, it doesn't get out or you don't know, but it is a technical breach, well, how do you do that? What, what, do, you, what do they do with that? So there are such things, but um, I don't, I think if you read this statement, it, it causes alarm bells and nervousness about what they're going to do, but I'm not so sure it gives me real clear direction of what, you know, don't do this or don't do that. That's why I like uh, regulation, because you can see it coming uh, better than I like um, regulation by enforcement, because that, that places the regulatory burden on somebody they picked out of the blue. It's not throughout the industry or throughout everything. It means that this guy is an example for everybody else, I really don't know if that is the way we should be doing regulation because the burden on the on the guy they pick first is pretty bad. 
So when you're thinking about regulation or rules, it's necessarily going to be more truncated analysis, or why have it? If all you're going to say is, let's do rule of reason effects based, you don't need it. And so uh, rules, to me, sort of ex ante regulations as opposed to the more flexible case by case economic based um, antitrust analysis it would only be appropriate like if you're harnessing decision theory then when we actually have evidence that this is the type of thing that almost always is harmful like price fixing right and when you have economic regulation there's a whole economics literature on this the the economic basis for regulation is that as a necessary but not sufficient condition you need to have some kind of identifiable market failure and i don't i and i don't see that you know what what those are like so show me you know why is it like under the existing rules for uh, refusals to deal or tying are we seeing that there's a problem um so and then only if you have this identifiable market failure then then do you go on you still need to survive a rigorous cost benefit analysis so for me, I, I understand the burden. Believe me, I was at Qualcomm during that time, um, and uh, I was in-house, and, and I represent companies, and I understand the burden and the disruption, the incredible disruption for parties, and then the follow-on you know, domino effect abroad when the U.S. brings something the, all across the world, there's cases opened. Um, but I, I worry about rules because uh, because I just don't think we have the evidence to have these kind of presumptions of illegality or um, or outright bans. Uh, and, and I think we're going to talk about rulemaking. So. Um, oh, um, section. So the, there are there's a lot of a lot going around right now about rulemaking and the FTC. And um, not only you know do they have statutory authority to do it, but you know what will they do? What will they tackle first? You know what are your predictions there? Sure, so I'll start. So it was talked about on the last panel, whether the FTC, it's a question, do they even have the authority to codify bright line antitrust type prohibitions? So do they have rulemaking authority under unfair methods of competition? And the last panel was a little bit more skeptical than I am. I, I, I mean, I actually think this would probably, we would, I, would probably not, like they probably, would be struck down in court over time, but right now, under binding precedent or under the um, the DC circuits, they do this. The DC circuit did say in National Petroleum case that they have the authority for unfair methods of competition, and the Magnuson Moss Act that was talked about in last uh, panel that it only allows it for consumer protection or uh, unfair method, unfair and deceptive acts and practices explicitly carves out, it says it doesn't apply to UMC, which could go the other way, right? Why do you have to carve out something if you don't have the authority? So putting that aside, because again, I, I think that there's good arguments and I hope we see court challenges, um, but that takes time, right? Um, so what kind of rules are we likely to see? Well, based on the FTC's consultation that's been ongoing for a while now, uh, I think we'll see rules on an employee employment non-competes, uh, perhaps on exclusive dealing, and then maybe on a whole host of other things because the, the consultation sort of says, and what other kind of practices do you not like that are, you know, <coughs> sort of abusing bargaining power or unfair to small businesses? Uh, so you could see, and I was much more worried about this when uh, ChairCon first started than I am now as time's going on, but you, you, know, you, uh, my, you could see that a lot of the recommendations from the House Judiciary Committee Majority Staff Report uh, that you know, don't have the votes on the Hill, but they could be, try to be implemented through rulemaking front for methods. So things like um, per se illegality for tying by firms of the market power, getting rid of the recoupment requirement for predatory pricing, which is an incredibly important check. Uh, other things like that. Uh, so in other words, you know, completely inconsistent with decades of, by, of Supreme Court precedent for Section 2, um, and coming back to your good point about an inconsistency with the DOJ. Uh, the other thing is that, um, also, oh, the unintended consequences, right? I mean, rulemaking is really, really hard, right? So let's say, let's take a relatively easy, the employee non-competes. Let's say the employer said there's a rule that says, um, okay, 
uh, for anyone who makes over, you know, 10% more than the minimum wage, then you can't have a, uh, then uh, anyone below that, you can't have a non-compete. Well, if you work at a fast food restaurant and you get free meals, does that count? Um, what about benefits, right? And the unintended consequences are that, you know, what if employers just say, well, I'll just raise the salary just to 11%. Um, but then what does that mean? It's going to come from somewhere, right? So what does it come from, um, you know, the benefits or other things, right? So if you're going after conduct that's just ubiquitous in the marketplace, like tying and bundling and exclusive dealing, you know, companies are going to be, be smart about trying to get, their, get what they need to do as a business met, but in other ways um, that could be really costly, right? Could be a drag on the economy. Uh, and, and uh, you know, other unintended consequences. But I'll stop there. So um, I can't predict what they'll, what they'll do, what type of regulation they would try. Um, I do think, was that case, that was, they didn't say you can't do this regulation. They said we're going to leave for another day a decision on that, didn't they? No, so they, the, there I was forget. a rule, it's the only rule that still survives that's under the unfair methods competition. It's like a hybrid. It was under both the UMC and the UDAP. And um, in the district court, uh, that came out, you know, in my mind well, but the appellate court said, the appellate court um, allowed, said they, that, you know, they, ha they, they had the authority. So it's binding precedent allowing, and it's a rule that still stands. Right. And so my, here's, here's one of the problems with the FTC and why it's rulemaking, I think, would be under attack. And that, and that is this. If you look what they, they don't like multi-level marketing. They don't like it at all. They think Mary Kay is a, a Ponzi scheme. Uh, every state in this country has a law on multi-level marketing. And you go and you register in the state of California. The state of California, it does not have a light regulatory touch. And that you go and you, you get your multi-level marketing um, plan or scheme, if the FTC decides it, because again, a, a scheme is a plan you don't like, um, and, and you get it okayed by California and California looks at you every three or four years and you get it approved it is not it is not a Ponzi scheme you're actually making money from the products sold all, all the, the, the the traditional tests that have stood up in courts all across the country FTC doesn't like it so they start picking on these little people again and again and making all the and driving people out of business and they're getting rid of the multi-level marketing schemes now I don't know if they're good or bad I have no idea but I know that all the states have looked at this. All the states have a regulatory problem, and the FTC doesn't like it, so they butt in and and um, make their own rules. And someday they'll come after Mary Kay. I, I haven't yet, and I think it is because they like to pick on the small, get the rule approved by the courts in one way or another, and then say, "Oh, look, precedent." Um, so I do think that the the same applies. There's nothing I've I have litigated these non-competes all the time. And certain states don't allow them. California, Virginia doesn't. The only exception is if you can't take lists, you're a salesman, you can't take their sales lists, for instance. That's one thing even places which, which don't allow non-competes allow, that you can't take the crown jewels of the business with you and say uh, that's not a non-compete. But who knows what the FTC's rules will be, but I will tell you this. In the employment area, the states have a lot of power, and Congress knows what non-competes are. Why should the FTC be getting rid of non-competes? Who gave them that, that, that bailiwick? That, the idea, I, you know, in my own view, the FTC has a, a huge non-delegation problem because the words are too broad, and they've been interpreted too broadly and many times in our history. I don't think it's going to happen now. But I do think that whatever they try to regulate will likely be in an area that is well regulated. The one exception to this, I will say, is is this privacy. This privacy, they're very, uh, they are litigating as unfairness a lot of the privacy in these data breach, and that is a uh, an area that has that is unsettling everybody. So it's a new thing. It's not an old thing that the states have all taken care of. So. You know, if they did it on that, I think they'd have much firmer ground because there isn't so much other regulation in that area, certainly not national re re regulation. So I raised this question about why do you need it with the, given the states on a panel at NYU last week with some state AGs, and I, I, I think there was a, that there's, there is some, like, them, some holes that they, you know, and that, it's, it, and that the, the bans on them um, and, and so they they were saying there is room, you know, just to kind of the other side for for some for 
for looking at them as a competition issue, like where are they harming competition, right? Um, so that, that was the response. And for those of you who know me, you're probably like, Corinne, you're always so strong on the other side. But for me, I'm just like a con like if I hear all everyone agreeing, I want to make sure we hear the. That's other no side. fun on a panel, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so one last thing, I, I want to kind of turn our attention to the courts. Um, instead of just agency itself, we have um, Exxon coming up. It, it was argued before the Supreme Court last month. Um, probably see a decision sometime, probably in late June. Um, and although the question in Exxon itself is a very narrow question for the most part, um, it, it, the timing is very interesting. Um, you know, at the same time, we have the FTC losing in court, losing in its own administrative court. Um, there's the Illumina Grail merger challenge. There's the Jewel Altria uh, challenge. There's, um, well, there's Meta Within, which started the first day of hearings was yesterday. It didn't seem to go very well for the agency. Um, there's a lot of dubious actions kind of going on at um, the FTC as the courts are now taking a closer look at their procedures and processes in the context of these broader cases. So you know, what are your thoughts about that more generally and about Axon itself and how, how this all kind of plays out? So uh, my view of it is I, I think Axon's going to win. Uh, the issue there, um, and, and I've been looking at this from really when it was in district court, um, they, they felt that the, uh, the whole process was unconstitutional. That's basically the argument. They also didn't like the pre-clearance. I don't think that survived into the Supreme Court. Uh, I, I, I didn't hear much about it at oral argument, but I, th the whole idea was, hey, we could, have been, we could have been sued by the Justice Department and this wouldn't have happened because what, what the FTC had tried to do here, in, in, there had been a merger with a competitor and they tried to undo it and they once again went and in my view, screwed up patent law and said, you have to give these patents plus this money and spin off a new company to, to compete with you. The government gave me a patent that has certain, I, uh, I can act like a trust. I can act like a monopoly because it's a patent given by the government. It's in the constitution. It's an exception. I don't think they understand it. And I think they, they screwed up an axon in this. And I think there are, you are going to be allowed to, um, collaterally attack, or at least attack un the unconstitutional uh, aspects of some of their adjudications. I think that's going to be the outcome of Axan. More power to us. We are, New Civil Liberties had a case argued the same day against the SEC on the same issue, Cochrane. So I too represent clients and I too am interested. And uh, I, I, but I, I, I get a strong vibe that they are going to say, hey, wait a second, some of these things you've been doing aren't right, and people can challenge them in district courts. There is jurisdiction. It's really just a jurisdiction question. Does Have have the district courts been stripped of jurisdiction uh, over these issues? Um, and so I, I think the answer to that's going to be no, and I'm glad. So I, I have an article recently I wrote with a colleague, Sam Sherman, on the new uh, policy statement in the case law. And we do mention, you know, the Axon case and that while it's not directly on point for le whether the the statements approach may survive, you know it's 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 important to mention as a trend, right? I think when the FTC, if they're trying to do rules under unfair methods of competition, um, then it's more of an Administrative Procedure Act type type, you, you know for that that's what they follow. So they're going to rely probably on the Chevron deference, right? And so then them and and that's kind of you know been 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 very you know. Uh, by the, by our current court, um, you know, I would think, you know, might even be done away with, if not completely, you know, very, very narrowed. So, uh, I, you know, coming back, I think your point was a good one, and I've heard Professor Bill Kovacic make this, that, and Kovacic has said it more in terms of uh, worry for, for Chair Khan, that w when he was chair, he was worried about the FTC being uh, eliminated, being do done away with, you know, and and that in times where there's been broad overreach, um, it's not, you know, there's calls for the, the to, to get rid of the agency, and so that he's very worried and 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 um, curious about the approach at this time to take such expansive approaches. Now, you know, I will say on the policy statement, I have heard some people say. There's no way they could believe that this will survive in court, and so this was a purely political statement. Uh, I, I, again, I think they're true believers. I don't think so. I think this is an intention of what they will try to do. Uh, and then there is that culture of consents, you know, that they could get it through commitments. 
Um, but we'll see what kind of cases they bring. And, and on that, you know, even today, uh, I think there was a kind of a, a brushback pitch to Elon Musk on ownership of Twitter because he's in one of the Twitter's in one of these consent agreements, and they're going to interpret the. Now, one of the interesting things that we don't, I don't have seen that much of, is these consent agreements really do have you by the short hairs, and most people just do whatever the, the FTC wants. If if that if that consent agreement was negotiated with the 2015 statement FTC, which I think it was, um, then they you have a new FTC with a new view of what the consent state, statement means, and it's an order that has to be enforced by the court. The real overreach, I think, might be is if they switch something they thought in a consent order and they get brushed back by that by the courts, I think that would be a disaster for the FTC. I don't know if that's happening, but I think that that would be a problem for them if by changing their analysis, they actually had one of their consent orders interpreted against them. Right, clear contracts. <laughs> um, we only, we're running out of time here right before the reception, but um, have time for maybe one or two questions. Um, Dan. So uh, it's a nice discussion. I appreciate Warren uh, trying to uh, bring multiple perspectives uh, to bear here. And, and I, I, I bet that's a, a feature of good counsel for some of our clients. I do want to push back a little bit on a couple of things. One, uh, and both have to do with precedence. And so I think it's just true that a lot of antitrust cases uh, rely on elements of judgment. We don't have everything nailed down with precision, the thing that bothers me about, uh, but I think the court also knows that the economists of the FTC do quite a lot of work trying to have well-rounded <laughs> estimates of things like ranges of likely price effects, output effects, and so forth. And the thing that bothers me about the statement is not the idea that you might have cases where you need to make a judgment call on rough orderings, but the repudiation of the idea that a numerical cost-benefit analysis could count, or that measurement should count. And then I think on the other point, with all of these magic words, right, they're all plucked from precedents, a lot of circuit court precedents, some Supreme Court precedents. You know, there's the fact that they're old cases but there's also the fact that almost all of them are dicta, right? So, right, there's stuff on exploitative maybe being a factor in this or that way in a couple of cases in dicta. I mean, in fact, a lot of the cases went against the government, right? So it's dicta in a case that went the other way. Really, none of these things establish a clear idea either the present court or the court of 40 or 50 years ago thought exploitative really meant under antitrust law or coercive really meant under antitrust law. There's sort of dicta musings on characters of things going on in the cases that might count. And so, I mean, to me, that's not really grounded. It's sort of like having a list of applications where they say, well, tying, bundling. Right, there's law saying that even under the Sherman Act, there could be such things as tying arrangements. But you think, well, on the other hand, there's all sorts of tying and bundling that's perfectly lawful. I want to buy a car, I buy the whole car, I don't want cards. Um, and, and so so the question is not like whether there could be something there, but what else are you say, telling me you're getting at by saying, well, that's an application of these magic words? And so I think. I don't know how any given district court or court of appeals or even the Supreme Court would rule, but the idea that all these things are well grounded in precedent seems to me to be a stretch. It's something they work to create an impression of, but I, I, don't, I don't think most of it's. So I'll take the second one first. So I'm saying, so th thanks for the clarification. I, I am saying that the words themselves are in Supreme Court precedents. No, every approach is, and I mean, there's only a handful of cases, right? There's the Supreme Court cases stop in 72, and then there's three appellate court cases from the 80s. But I was saying that the three appellate court cases from the 80s really say 
you got to give parties some kind of ability to comply. So you got to have clear standards. That, that's what they're saying, right? The, the, um, the Texaco decision from 68 from the Supreme Court is pretty darn broad, right? They say there that the use of economic power um, to sort of curtail competition in another market is enough. And in that case, they found that, well, okay, Texaco, you, you know, your, your, your retail stations, them knowing what kind of products you want to, to stock, well, just them knowing it and you being, you know, important to them for gasoline, that they're definitely going to stock those other products, even if you're not telling them they need to, even if, you know, there, and there was no finding of market power in any of the markets. Like, those are pretty broad, right? Yeah, that's, the, that's like coercion. It's like, and it was, and in that case, they said, okay, no actual coercion, but kind of like, um, sort of, core. I mean, you know, retailers, uh, the retail gas stations, knew that the powerful person wanted them, so then they would do it. Th that's pretty darn broad. So and I, then, I, sorry, the first the first point... You, oh, you, uh, I was just saying, I, yeah. I think we have some people need to leave at five, okay. maybe, so... Just kind of we'll talk after. But good, but good question. <laughs> sorry. No, no, no. Um, John, do you have anything to add to that? I don't. Um, so, with that, um, we're going to close out um, for the reception. Um, we're happy to you know, stay here, I, or at least um, I can stay here, and others um, I'm sure can too, and talk to you more about antitrust. And um, we have drinks in the back, and there will be food and everything too. So, thank you all for coming. <laughs>